Okay, good morning, everyone. So today we're going to read There's a Hair in My Dirt, a worm story by Gary Larson. And this is an excellent story in terms of teaching you about human impact and the ways that we don't always understand that we're affecting the environment, but that we do. And there's, there's a lot of humor in here. Uh, anyone know the far side? So it, it's, an, it's an older cartoon type story, but it, it's more towards the adult side. But he's, he's got a very twisted set, sense of humor. So look at the pictures and things as we're watching it, and you'll, you'll get a lot, of, a lot of laughs out of it as well. Okay, beneath the floor of a very old forest nestled in among some nice, rich topsoil lived a family of worms, earthworms to be exact. They had just begun to dine when the little worm, staring wide out at his meal, suddenly spit out his food and screamed, There's a hair in my dirt! There's a hair in my dirt! Look at him. And sure enough, there it was, plain as day, they could all see it. At first, the little one was horrified, but soon that gave way to being just plain mad. I hate being a worm, he screeched, his tiny body trembling. We're the lowest of the low, bottom of the food chain, bird food, fish bait. What kind of life is this anyway? We never go swimming or camping or hiking or anything. Shoot, we never even go to the surface unless the rain floods us out. All we ever do is crawl around the stupid ground. Oh, and how can I forget? We eat dirt. Dirt for breakfast, dirt for lunch, and dirt for dinner. Dirt, dirt, dirt. Look, now there's even a hair in my dirt. The final insult. I can't stand it any longer. I hate being a worm. And with that, the little worm slumped back in his chair, exhausted by his outburst. Mother worm, an expression of concern on her face, looked from her pouting son to father worm. She had constantly tried to make their home as cheery as possible even going so far as always putting silverware on the table, despite the fact that none of them had arms. But Father Worm, a proud invertebrate and a learned member of the Analita phylum, even with his small rudimentary brain, was glaring at what he considered to be an ungrateful and ignorant son. Well, 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 he said, breaking the awkward silence. Let me get this straight. Not only is your mother's dirt not good enough for you, but you feel being a worm isn't exactly a charmed life, eh? A strange glint fell across Father Worm's eye. My boy, I think it's time I tell you a story. Mom says here, maybe I should have added some oregano to the dirt. The little worm looked up and sneered sarcastically. If this is the one about the teenage worms and the insane trout fishermen, I've heard that one a gazillion times. No, no, Father Worm calmly responded. Not that story, though it is a good story. This one is different. This story is a happy ending. I have an idea, Mother Worm chimed in enthusiastically. Let's listen to Father's story and afterwards maybe we can all have some fresh cold dirt for dessert. And Little Worm says, I'm in hell. And so Father Worm cleared his long, primitive pharynx, <clears throat> took a futile puff on his dirt-filled pipe, and began his story. Once upon a time in a forest not too far from here lived a beautiful young maiden. Her name was Harriet, and Harriet loved the magic of nature, with all its magnificent plants and animals. One lovely spring morning, she decided to take a stroll along her favorite woodland trail. What wondrous things will I see today, Harriet thought to herself. I must say she was excited as a tapeworm in a meat patty. You guys getting these jokes at all? Tapeworm in a meat patty? Tapeworms eat meat, they eat food? <laughs> with her first steps, Harriet took a deep breath and filled her lungs with fresh air. Oh, thank you, trees and other plants, she called out. Thank you for making the air so crisp and clean. Well, as anyone with half a ganglion knows, ganglion are your nerve cells in your brain, the plants did a little more than just make the air crisp and clean. They made the air air. Every molecule of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere was put there by a plant. And last time I looked, the living were quite fond of oxygen. Heck, 
Even the dead need it, or they'd hang around a lot longer and get on everyone's nerves, right? You need the oxygen for decomposers, right? And so the bear is holding a sign here. It says, field guide to the humans. Now, kind of funny, people usually have field guide to identify animals. The bear is using it. Ha, ha, ha. Soon Harriet met a family of squirrels who came bounding toward her, unafraid and looking for a possible treat. Gathering nuts from a nearby tree, Harriet was quick to accommodate them. Oh, you're all so cute, she gushed. To be sure these furry creatures had that cute thing down real good, regrettably, you see, Harriet was feeding gray squirrels, a large, aggressive species that had been introduced to this forest and were taking it over from the native red squirrels, a smaller, more timid species. All squirrels are rodents, but at the wrong time and place, some are rats. And this guy's got a jacket that says, I kicked Thumper's uh, ass. Kind of funny, right? I'm going to leave that with you. Thank you. Around the bend, the forest opened into a meadow of wildflowers as far as the eye could see. My, Harriet exclaimed, bedazzled. I'm gazing at a painting. Oh, Mother Nature, what an artist you are. Oh, Mother Nature, what a sex maniac you are, may have been a better choice of words, for Harriet was actually gazing upon a reproductive battlefield, using bright colors, nectar, mimicry, deception, and whatever other tricks they had up their leaves. These floral sirens were competing for the attention of pollinating insects. In a field of flowers, all is fair in bugs and war. A little ways farther, Harriet happened to look down and saw a column of ants crossing the trail. Ah, she smiled, noticing all the eggs they were carrying. Even the littlest creatures take good care of their babies. How adorable. Adorable? Well, as Grandpa Worm used to say, about as adorable as a nest of baby robins. These were Amazon ants, a species that, despite its name, lives in many parts of the world and specializes in the enslavement of other species. And Harriet was watching a raiding party returning home with their living booty. This guy's got a, the egg saying, is that you, Mom? By the way, you guys get it? Adorable is a nest of baby robins. A worm. Nest of baby robins. Author's note, although most slave ants spend their lives rolling, roiling away, getting up early to milk the aphids, a few escape that fate by doting on the queen. Entomologists often describe these slackers as abdomen kissers. As the trail widened and the trees thinned out, Harriet heard a rumbling sound. Looking up, she spied a familiar truck heading her way. She immediately recognized the ruggedly handsome and rosy-cheeked character behind the wheel. Hello, Lumberjack Bob, she called, waving with happy excitement, knowing him to be a gentle man with a quick smile and a big heart. Well, kind, big-hearted, and rosy-cheeked he might be, the latter caused by expanded capillaries in his skin's dermal layer, but Lumberjack Bob was really just a regular guy with little education doing the one job he knew how to do, cutting down ancient trees that were here long before the first intestinal worms came over in the pilgrims. Look at that, Lumberjack Bob ran over a squirrel. Oh my God. I know. Stupid. Harriet then heard a magical sound from the canopy of trees above. Oh, she cried skyward. Listen to the songs of those happy, happy birds. Well, if those birds were happy, may the garden gods cut me in half with a rusty shovel. Birds singing to communicate, and what they were communicating was mostly an array of insults, warnings, and come-ons to members of their own species. In fact, all baby birds are taught by their parents not to even smile, or their beaks will crack. This story is for the birds, if you ask me, the little worm interrupted suddenly. Some lady taking a walk in the woods? Oh, I can't stand the excitement. If you have to tell me a story, you can at least tell me one that's sort of exciting, like Mr. Dung Beetle finds his field of dreams. Now that's a cool story. The dung beetle's looking out with binoculars at the cows. Get it? Field of dreams for a dung beetle? <laughs> dung beetle's like dung. 
cow excretions. I'm telling you this story, Father Worm, ra Father Worm, rather testily. So just put a fish hook in that mouth of yours and let me finish. Now, where was I? Oh, yes. In the distance, Harriet noticed some movement at the far side of the meadow. Bonds, she happily exclaimed. And as she watched them making, taking turns chasing each other and frolicking while their mother grazed, she mused out loud. Yes, little ones, go ahead and play your silly games, for soon you'll be all grown up and have to say goodbye to such carefree antics. And this guy's yelling, George, no, as he's frying up some of the eggs from the nest. Silly games, carefree antics, leech livers. As young animals play, they literally become smarter as extra neurons are formed in their brains. And of course, smarter deer have a better chance of survival than dumber ones. You know, Bambi's mom never played much as a kid. And look what happened to her. You guys ever see Bambi? You know, Bambi's the mom. So this deer is wearing a hunter mask. Looks like Bob. Around the next bend, the path skirted a lovely pond, and Harriet was elated to see a slow-moving, jumpy creature just in front of her. Mr. Turtle, she squealed excitedly, scooping up the startled reptile. And then with a sympathetic smile, she added, What are you doing out of your pond, Mr. Turtle? Well, I think I'll just send you right back home. So Harriet wound up the bewildered animal and threw it into the middle of the marsh where it landed with a loud and satisfying kerplunk. Well, unfortunately, Mr. Turtle was not a turtle at all but a tortoise. And while turtles are well adapted for aquatic life, their land-dwelling cousins never even evolved into decent dog paddlers. Sadly, the little reptile sank to the bottom, where promptly drowned. Even worse, who knows how many of our parasitic loved ones went down with the ship. And he's saying, oh, the irony. As the middle of the pond bubbled, Harriet's eye was caught by large and colorful insects flying just above the surface. Dragonflies, she exulted. Oh, look how they dance in the air like winged ballerinas. Winged ballerinas, winged assassins, and tutus might have been closer to the truth. Dragonflies are skilled predators, and if their graceful aerobatics have anything to do with dancing, then I'm a sea monkey's uncle. Right? They're really good at getting mosquitoes and things. Harriet thought she saw something move in the tall grass near her feet. Dropping gracefully to her knees, she almost put her hand on a small slug that was wandering by. Recoiling in disgust, she cried, Stay away from me, you slimy little thing. And then, seeing the real object of her desire, she lunged forward and came up with her prize. Hello, Mr. Frog, she said laughing. Should I kiss you and see if I, you turn into a prince? Fortunately for Harriet, she didn't kiss this little creature, for it wasn't Mr. Frog. She was holding, but Mr. Toad. And like most toads and some frogs, this one packed a powerful, sometimes lethal, toxin in its skin. On the other hand, the slug slime was actually quite harmless, if perhaps a bit gooey. Kissing out of your species is not really recommended soon, son, but if you have to, always choose a gastropod over an amphibian. Gastropods have their stomachs. Um near their feet, gastro stomach, pods foot like a slug, and amphibians, like frogs, they, they live part of their life in the water. So notice she's got some insects in the bottom of her shoe. She's not being careful, stepping on living things. Ernie Johnson, Mother Worm suddenly blurted out. What? 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 Father Worm asked, finding his story interrupted the second time. Ernie Johnson, his wife repeated. I went to my high school prom with a slug named Ernie Johnson. And Ernie's slime might have been harmless, but it certainly wrecked my evening. Before the night was over, I was wishing I had bought, brought a salt shaker. All right, what happens if you put salt on a slug? Why? It shrivels due to osmosis, right? The water diffuses out of the slug's skin. Well, what made Dad... Well, what made you fall for Dad, the little worm asked. He's slimy too, isn't he? No, not exactly, Mother Worm replied. Your father has always been more on what I'd like the sticky side. 
May I please continue, Father Worm? Screamed Father Worm. That is that the two of you are through discussing the viscosity of my mucus. Right, how slippery it is, viscosity. Releasing the frog, Harriet continued on her way. The trail soon brought her to the edge of a small river, where she saw a most remarkable sight. Large hook-nosed fish, their red scales shimmering in the sunlight, were struggling to get upstream. Salmon, she joyfully declared, looking for their spawning grounds, I bet. Well, technically speaking, the salmon were looking for their spawning weren't looking for their spawning grounds, they were smelling them. When salmon hatch, the smell of home is branded into their brains forever. And even though they may wander in the ocean for years, their incredible noses will one day lead them right back to where life began. Now, we earthworms have our own little miracle when it comes to breeding. Each of us contains both male and female reproductive organs. But that's a story I'll tell you when you're a little longer, son. They're hermaphroditic. Worms have both male and female reproductive organs. And get it? Not when he's older. When he's longer, he's a worm. As the trees closed in on Harriet, the forest grew darker and darker. Sensing that she was being watched, Harriet looked up into a nearby tree and was momentarily startled to see a pair of large, ominous eyes staring back at her. Oh, I recognize you now, Mr. Owl, she laughed. And fireflies, she gleefully cried as a group of little insects suddenly swarmed around her. They're the fairies of the night, enchanting the forest with their magical little lights. Ha! Did Harriet ever get taken in by one of the oldest tricks in nature's book? The old, I'm a scary creature with giant eyeballs gag. You see, Mr. Owl is really a royal moth, an insect that use, uses its large wing spots to mimic a much more frightening animal. One once scared the dirt out of me. And those fireflies, which really weren't fireflies at all, but beetles were using a cold chemical process to produce light and attract potential mates. Beautiful, yes, but if anyone thinks they are magical, I've got some hard pan in Florida to sell them. What's hard pan? Unrich soil, bad dirt, right? You're a worm, you like dirt. Soon our maiden was confronted by a sight that saddened her deeply. An immense tree as old as the forest itself was lying on the ground. Oh, I'm so sorry, Harriet said, touching the fallen giant. Such a tragedy, such a waste. Oh, you poor, beautiful tree. Well, truthfully, the tree's fate was a far cry from being a waste. These huge nurse trees, as their name implies, are the key to new growth and the survival of the entire forest. In fact, the fallen tree is argu arguably more alive than a standing one. So much of their mass is taken up with other organisms, as a famous worm once wrote, I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a big rotting tree carcass. Right? What might trees have in it? Bacteria, fungus, insects. Right? And look at that. This tree fell on Lumberjack Bob. Harriet was suddenly surprised to come across a little baby bird lying helplessly on the ground. She gently scooped up the scared little creature and searched for a nest in the highest reaches of a nearby tree. Poor little guy, she cooed. Did you fall out of your home? Well, I'll put you right back where you belong. Climbing the tree, Harry appeared into the nest. There you go, she said, placing the trembling baby bird alongside its sibling. You two youngsters are together again. But not for long. As soon as Harriet was gone, the fledgling found itself plummeting back to earth. You see, she had rescued a baby golden eagle, a species in which the strongest sibling ensures its own survival by giving its younger brothers and sisters the old heave-ho. Author's note, this behavior always takes place in the parent's absence, which would come as no surprise to the younger siblings of all other species. Anyone a younger sibling? You get picked on? Sometimes? All right, you get it. But this, this, is an, this is a, you know, survival of the fittest, right? This is how you ensure the strongest genes get passed on because the stronger one gets rid of the young, the weaker one, right? It ensures its own survival, more food, more care, things like that. Scrambling up the tree, Harriet's view was marred by the sight of a forest fire raging out of control, but fortunately moving away from her. Oh, the suffering, the loss of life, she lamented. Someone should try and put it out. There's a eagle carrying a poodle away. 
Someone should just mind their own business from nature's point of view. Big, healthy trees won't burn very easily unless the flames are stoked with lots of fallen branches and debris. Occasional fires of certain two-legged vertebrates would just let them run their course, benefit the forest by keeping all that dangerous kindling from piling up. But boy, if it does pile up, whoosh, better watch your interior end. What's the interior end? Your back end, right? Posterior is your front end. Anterior is your back end. There's two squirrels having a barbecue here. Looks like they might have started that fire. But Harriet's spirits didn't stay dampened for long, and she decided it was time to return home. As she hummed a cheery tune, she reflected on how lucky she was to live in the forest and be so close to nature. Oh, the things she had seen. But then, without warning, Harriet came across something she didn't want to see, a sight that chilled her blood. A snake, she screamed, and trapped within the serpent's coils, being slowly suffocated, was a small, hapless, helpless mouse. The poor creature, almost expired, was emitting faint squeaks, and his scared eyes seemed to meet Harriet's in one last look of hope. Acting quickly, Harriet grabbed a nearby stick and began striking the reptile repeatedly. Take that, you drivel thing. Bonk. And that. Bonk. And two more. Bonk. Bonk. Soon it was over. The snake was dead. Boy, was he ever. Catching her breath, Harriet reached down and gently removed the unconscious mouse from the snake's lifeless coils. And as the fair maiden watched, a, mir a miracle occurred. The little mouse stirred. He was alive. A minute later, he got groggily to his feet, looked up at Harriet, and wiggled his nose. Harriet beamed. As she held the little mouse in one hand, she wiped a tear away with the other. She put the little fellow down at her feet, where he quickly bounded off into the tall grass safe and sound. Harriet headed home. Good had triumphed over evil, and the forest was just a little bit safer for everyone. Well, actually, the snake Harriet killed was a king snake, an efficient rodent-eating predator, and that cute little mouse she saved was a vector for a deadly disease. What's a vector? It's carrying a deadly disease. It carries it, right? Like mosquitoes are vectors for West Nile virus and uh, things like that. When Harriet wiped the tear from her eye, a virus which was living in, on the mouse's fur invaded her body. And one lovely spring morning, Harriet, delirious with fever, stumbled out of her little cottage, fell over, and died. The end. She died, the little worm yelled. What kind of story is that? That's supposed to cheer me up? Boy, I'm really full of warm, wormy feelings now. Thanks, Dad. She's saying, hey, somebody's got their bait on the table. Oh, here comes the moral. This kid is fish bait, Dad says. Father Worm sat back in his chair, trying to be patient, but secretly thinking his son was perhaps short a neuron or two. Look, my boy, he said, I'm afraid you haven't quite grasped the point of this story. You see, Father Worm began, Harriet loved nature, but loving nature is not the same as understanding it. And Harriet not only misunderstood the things she saw, vilifying some creatures while romanticizing others, but also her own connection to them, Father Worm paused, his eyes narrowing. Ah, connection, son. That's the faithful key that Harriet missed, the key to understanding the natural world. Father Worm sat back, stretching himself out to his full, glorious three and a half inches. Take us worms, for example. We till, aerate, and enrich the earth's soil, making it suitable for plants. No worms, no plants. No plants. No so-called higher animals running around with their oh-so-precious backbones. Right? Worms are invertebrates. He was really getting into it now. Heck, we're invertebrates, my boy. As a whole, we're the movers and shakers on this planet. Spineless superheroes. That's what we are. And since Father Worm didn't have a fist to bring down on the table, he just yelled, bang! The little worm sat there for a moment thinking about what his father had just told him. And it was true. He was feeling a little better about his lot in life, maybe even a little proud. But then he remembered something. 
these bugs are saying, look down in the ground, it's a root, it's a shoelace. No, it's worm boy. Little worm's thinking that. Okay, I get it. Being a worm ain't so bad. But you're wrong about one thing. That story didn't have a happy ending. You said it had a happy ending. Well, it does, replied his father, if you're a worm. And then he leaned across the table until his face was very, very close to his son's and said with a big grin, which brings us back to that hair in your dirt. Or should I say, mom saying, I love this part. Harriet. Mother giggled, father guffawed, and the son frowned, then smiled, then broke out in laughter. And after they all stopped laughing, the little worm finished his whole dinner, went to bed, and had the best dreams ever. Why is this a happy ending? Harriet became fertilizer for the soil, right? Enriched it for the worms. And Harriet's hair became that hair in his dirt. That's cool, right? All right, the end. Authors note, well, truthfully, earthworms don't really sit around dinner tables complaining, telling stories, laughing, and so on. On the other hand, they do have a message for all of us. What is it? Can you read it? See you soon. We're all going to be Harriet one day, aren't we? See you soon. <laughs> I told you it was twisted humor. All right, the end.